Hey. All right, we are almost done with The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. This is chapter 15, which is the last numbered chapter. Um, there is also an epilogue, so we're doing chapter 15 this week, epilogue next week, and then we're done. Right in time. Chapter 15 is called Meeting Ted and Tom. I wonder who Ted is and whether Ted has anything to do with Ted Talks. <clears throat> After arriving in Arusha, I boarded a bus to the Ngurdoto Mountain Lodge, where the conference was being held. As the bus exited the airport, I gazed out the window to see if Tanzania looked any different from Malawi, but what I saw was very similar. The highway was filled with minibuses crammed with people. A giant lorry, that's like British for truck. A giant lorry belched smoke and swerved to miss an old man on a bicycle. Thank you. There were children in rags hawking cigarettes on the roadside while students in bright uniforms marched through the dust to school. I saw village women balancing loads of vegetables on their heads and farmers tending their fields. But unlike Malawi, Arusha had trees. And not only that, after some minutes, the shuttle driver pointed off in the distance and said, look there, Kilimanjaro, the biggest mountain in Africa. Mount Kilimanjaro appeared even more grand and majestic than I'd seen in books with ribbons of white snow along its peak and cloaked in a thin layer of clouds. It was hard to imagine that ordinary people like myself actually climbed to the top, but I knew they did. In my head, I began making a list of all the other places in the world I wanted to see. That mountain filled me with great confidence, but it all seemed to vanish once I reached the hotel. The lobby was a scene of chaos and confusion filled with white people speaking English and Africans with, Africans with strange and foreign accents. Sorry, there's a language called Afrikaans. That's why I pronounced it that way, but they're just talking about Africans. Everyone was chatting on their mobile phones and talking in loud, booming voices. I prayed that no one would speak to me. And after registering at the welcome center, I walked to the corner of the room and tried to disappear. That's how I always want to do in a crowded room too. No such luck. After some minutes, a man walked up and stuck out his hand. He had red hair and wore purple and green eyeglasses. Hello, welcome to Ted, he said. My name is Tom. Who are you? <clears throat> I'd practiced only one line of English, so I let it fly. I'm William Kamkwamba and I'm from Malawi. He stared at me strangely. Maybe I'd said it in Chichewa? Wait a minute, he said. You're the guy with the windmill. Tom Riley was in charge of organizing all the corporate sponsors at TED including the ones who had paid for my airfare and hotel. Months earlier in New York, Emeka, the Nigerian blogger, had told Tom about my windmill saying, you'll never believe this story. But Tom didn't know that Emeka had then searched under every rock in Malawi to find me. After talking a while, Tom asked if I wanted to tell my story on stage in front of all these people. I shrugged, why not? <laughs> Do you have a computer? He asked. I shook my head. Do you have any photos of the windmill? I did have these. A friend of Dr. Mkazime had visited Medici a few weeks earlier and helped prepare a presentation in case I needed it. We got a helicopter. All right, I think it's passing. <clears throat> He'd done this on his laptop, though 
At the time, I had no idea this was a computer. To me, computers were like big televisions and plugged into the wall. Before the man left, he handed me a strange cube, a flash drive attached to a rope and said, wear this around your neck. This is your presentation. So when Tom asked about my photos, I handed him the cube. He then plugged it into another laptop and said, I'll just copy these onto my computer. It was then I realized what a laptop was. Of course, I thought, it's a portable computer. What a good idea. <laughs> Sensing my delight at this discovery, Tom asked me, William, have you ever seen the internet? The what? No, I said. In a quiet conference room, Tom sat me down and introduced me to this most amazing tool. This is Google, he said. You can find answers to anything. What do you want to search for? That was easy. Windmill. In one second, he pulled up five million page results pictures and models of windmills I'd never even imagined. My God, I thought, where was this Google when I needed it? Well, he had books, didn't he? Next, we pulled up a map of Malawi, then a photo of Wimbe itself taken from a camera in outer space. I think they must be on Google Earth. It's funny to me now, at this conference in East Africa with some of the world's greatest innovators of science and technology just outside the door, there I was in this room seeing the internet for the first time. Tom helped me set up my own email account and for the next week he introduced me to a range of technology, smartphones, video and 35 millimeter cameras, even an iPod Nano, which I turned over and over in my hand before finally asking, where is the battery? Uh, an iPod Nano is like those little guys and they're smaller than any, you know, well, I guess not the teeny tiny watch batteries, but they're little. Not long after, I'd be hacking into iPods and iPhones and repairing them for people. But the most amazing thing about Ted wasn't the internet, the gadgets, or even the breakfast buffets with three kinds of meat plus eggs and pastries and fruits that I dreamt about each night. It was the other Africans who stood on stage and shared their visions of how to make our continent a better place. There was Corneli Iwango, a biologist from Congo who'd risked his life to save endangered animals during the country's civil war. He'd even buried his Land Rover engines and stashed lab equipment in the trees to hide them from the rebels. A man from Ethiopia invented a kind of refrigerator that works using water evaporation from sand. Others were doctors and scientists using creative ideas and methods to fight AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Even Eric Herzman was there, one of the first people, along with Mike McKay, to write about my windmill on his blog, Africa Gadget. Oh, Afri Gadget, Afri Gadget. It'd be interesting to look up these blogs. I wonder if they still exist. Eric was raised in Kenya and Sudan as the son of missionaries. You know, Miss Amira is from Sudan. <clears throat> what he said summed up our crowd perfectly. Where the world sees trash, Africa recycles. Where the world sees junk, Africa sees rebirth. As far as my presentation went, when I heard Chris Anderson, the event's host, call my name, my legs refused to work. Don't worry, Tom whispered, squeezing my shoulder. Just take a deep breath. 
My heart beat fast like a Maganda drum as I climbed the steps to face the audience, which totaled about 450 people. All the inventors and scientists and doctors who'd shared their stories and ideas the previous days, they were now watching me. When I reached the stage and turned around, I went completely blind. Lights from the ceiling were shining into my eyes, so bright I couldn't even think. All the words I'd prepared seemed to dance to the drum and get lost in the glare. We've got a picture, said Chris. He pointed to something behind me, and a giant photo of my parents' house appeared. I saw the mud brick walls, grass roof, bright blue sky. I could feel the sun. Where is this? he asked. This is my home. This is where I live. Where? What country? In Malawi, Kasungu, I said, then quickly corrected myself. Ah, uh, Kasungu, Malawi. My hands began to shake. Five years ago, you had an idea, Chris said. What was that? I want to made a windmill. Chris smiled. So what did you do? How did you realize that? I took a deep breath and gave it my best. After I drop out from school, I went to library and I get information about windmill. Keep going, keep going. And I try and I made it. I expected the audience to laugh at my silly English but to my surprise, all I heard was applause. Not only were they clapping, but they were standing and cheering. And when I finally returned to my seat, I noticed that several were even crying. After all the years of trouble, the famine and fear for my family, dropping out of school, Kamba's death, and the teasing I received trying to develop my idea, I was finally being recognized. For the first time in my life, it's that bird again, sorry. For the first time in my life, I felt I was surrounded by people who understood what I did. A huge weight seemed to leave my chest and fall to the assembly floor. I could finally relax. I was now among colleagues. For the next couple of days, they lined up to meet me. William, can I take my photo with you? William, please join us for lunch. One line from my presentation even became a kind of motto for the conference. Everyone, everywhere I went, people shouted, I try and I made it. I was so flattered. I wished my parents, Gilbert and Jeffrey had been there to see it. They would have been proud. <clears throat> I'm gonna record the rest of the chapter on a separate video.